Today, I want to talk a bit more in depth about systems courses that you might take in your undergraduate CS program. I will start by looking at what courses are available at most institutions, and for those that I have experience with, I will talk about what they generally entail. After that, I will talk about the general benefits of taking systems courses, and finally wrap up with advice on how you should approach them to get the most out of the benefits. If you find what I talk about interesting, then please consider subscribing. With that out of the way, before we even start talking about systems courses, we need to define what they even are and explain a bit as to why I would even make a video on this topic. So when I talk about systems within the context of computer science, I'm obviously talking about computer systems and systems courses will generally cover topics related to how either computers work at a low level or how multiple computers would communicate to work together. In other words, these courses can range from discussing how a binary string is decoded and executed on a processor, all the way to how large-scale distributed computing clusters attain the greatest possible speedup for a given computation task. So, knowing what systems courses are, I feel like I really need to address an important question. Why am I making a video about them? The answer is simple to me. Systems courses have a surprisingly horrible brand image, and I'm doing something to improve the reputation of systems courses in the mind of CS students. Immediately, another question arises from those that have not encountered systems courses before. Why do they have a bad brand image? Well, the answer to the question is not as simple. My guess is that they are perceived as incredibly time consuming and just painful while providing no real life usefulness. With the rest of this video, I hope that I can make a convincing case that, that is just not the case. Oh, I also wanted to make this video to provide a high-level summary of what it is that I find interesting and enjoy working on to my mom, who isn't super technical, but that is not really important, so let's move right into the first part of the video. To start, I base the list that will follow off of what I covered at the University of Alberta and what I got to see at a couple other universities across North America. The research was not particularly thorough, so my discussion might not be comprehensive. However, I'm mostly focusing on what an average CS student might take. After all, I do not need to sell systems courses to those that are already excited about taking them. Alright, let's get our hands dirty. This list may seem a bit long at first, but I will go over each one to explain what actually goes on behind the course title quickly. Let's begin with Computer Organization and Architecture. This course will generally be a tougher course at most universities where they will teach you about some assembly language and then cover how a simpler CPU might take those assembly instructions and execute them. You will generally cover some CPU's simplified data path, what caches are, pipelining, and maybe some CPU level concurrency management tricks. Moving on to computer networks. This course will generally go over how computers talk to each other you will be introduced to the seven layer OSI stack and discuss where things like TCP, UDP, HTTP, IP addresses, MAC addresses come from and where they go on the seven layer OSI stack. Sadly, the topic of computer networks is way too big to ever fit in a single course. And so they do not go in depth enough to cover some really neat industry standard protocols. There is a lot of neat stuff in computer networks, but we need to move on to operating systems. This course will generally cover how a computer operating system actually runs. Cool topics such as concurrency, IO, inter-process communication, processes, scheduling, virtualization, file systems, and more are covered. This course will typically have some large assignments where you have to either implement a part of the OS or write complicated programs that, that interact directly with the OS. Let's keep the discussion going with GPU programming. A course like this will generally talk about how to run your code on GPUs and why you would even want to. You would generally want to run code on the GPU because GPUs can execute a lot of instructions in parallel, thus leading to significant speedups in specific use cases. This course will talk about how the architecture of a GPU makes that possible and what are the use cases the GPUs are good at. I haven't taken a course on this topic, so I can't talk to quite the same depth as I can about compilers. This course will talk about how to write a program that can parse programming languages well, and how to go from textual input to something that a computer can 
actually execute. The discussion goes to lexers, parsers, abstract syntax trees, symbol tables, types, code generation, and other seemingly dry but incredibly interesting topics. The course is incredibly notorious at most universities to be very difficult because of the course projects. The course may seem to be too specific to be interesting, but you know what course seems cool right from the title? Parallel and distributed systems. This course basically combines everything you learned about concurrency from operating systems and a lot of things from computer networks and combines it in a beautiful systems soup. This course will generally talk about message passing, concurrency at scale, the trade-off between communication versus com computation, and might touch more on modern distributed systems. This course is usually taught either as systems theory or as a very applied and hands-on course. You know what course is only taught as pure theory? Performance modeling and evaluation. This course is effectively a math and stats course that will explain how to evaluate the performance of current systems and how to model systems using math and statistics. Typically, you will cover stochastic processes, queuing theory, and a bit of large-scale system simulation, with most examples stemming from computer networks and operating systems. If you like stats, math, and CS theory, then this course is beautiful like no other. Anyways, let's finish with this list by discussing program analysis. This course will basically cover the techniques and methods to analyze programs both with and without executing them. This is actually a super important area of systems, as it can lead you to ask very important questions about the performance of your program, or sometimes even answer certain questions. As an example, a program analysis tool could detect false sharing, an issue I discussed in a previous video, either by observing memory access patterns at runtime, or by observing that an array is too small to use properly with multiple threads before even running the program. Either way, that is all the courses that I wanted to present to you today. This is by no means a list of all systems courses that a university may offer, and some universities might not even cover some of the courses I mentioned. However, a large number of top universities I looked into had these courses in common. Anyways, with you now knowing what sort of courses you can expect to see offered in university, I really want to talk about why you should not shy away from systems courses. I will answer the question of why you should take systems courses by basically showing how certain concerns that a lot of students have about systems courses are not necessarily true. The main concerns I heard while in university were the theory I learned in class I will never need, there are no hard transferable skills being taught in these classes, and lastly, there are no jobs that need the exact things I learn in these classes. Let's address these one by one. Let's start with the first. I actually already made a video on the topic of why you should care about computer architecture before, and I hope I made a strong case there, but I think it's worth reiterating again why you will most probably need some things that you learned in the systems courses you end up taking. I'll actually make a couple assumptions here about what many people think of when they think of jobs in software. It's either web development or making apps. So with these jobs in mind, would systems courses still be useful? Absolutely. In the worst case, for the point I'm trying to make, even a front-end web developer will need to have a decent grasp of computer networks to understand how a website will end up reaching the customer through HTTP requests, and a decent grasp on operating systems, especially if you're dealing with asynchronous data requests from the backend of the website. If you end up working on the back end of a website, you will generally need to understand what ports are, how to do inter-process communication, understand certain network protocols at a deeper level, and sometimes even deal with concurrency. If you are interested in making apps, regardless of the platform, you will need to again understand the concepts behind asynchronous function calls, process scheduling, file systems and permissions, and sometimes even a bit of how a computer might schedule your app. These are the exact theoretical topics that you end up learning in classes like computer networks, OS, and distributed systems. But let's say you're a bit contrarian and want to go into data science or some flavor of machine learning. Well, you might actually get a good use out of computer architecture this way. If you want to make sure that your model trains fast or the inference time is very low, you will need to understand how to execute your code on the GPU and just how important it is to maximize the amount of the usable data set being located in your RAM instead of being in cold storage, or worse yet, across an entire network. 
I'm not even talking about the hardcore ML accelerators that exist out there, where understanding computer architecture and compilers becomes rather important. Anyways, I hope that I made a very good case for this concern, so let's move right along to the next one. Oh man, if I got a dollar for each time I heard a student complain about how useless their classes in C, or even worse, assembly, were, I would probably have a couple hundred bucks. Quite often, it seemed that students just could not, for whatever reason, see the forest through the trees. Well, I would like to try and show off the forest that is seen behind the seemingly impenetrable trees of systems programming languages. It is very common for systems courses to have very large programming assignments, or even group projects where you implement a non-trivial system in some low-level language. And let's immediately look at the common advice people give in relation to getting an internship or a job. Do non-trivial projects to put on your resume. It seems like there is a very large overlap between systems courses and this advice. And you know what? I would go as far as saying that when you do a project in a language that is somewhat restrictive, you will learn very well why certain common abstractions exist and, more importantly, what abstractions and tools you do not really need. These are incredibly important pieces of insight that if you actually learn when taking the Project Heavy Systems courses will be useful to you way past your university career. Additionally, a lot of people tend to complain that, ah, why would I use C? It doesn't even support object-oriented programming. Well, there are a lot of things that feel old and painful in C. But it's not like C is exactly the only language that does not support object-oriented programming. There is also Go. And Go, unlike C, is widely loved, even going as far as placing number 5 in the list of the most loved languages in the 2020 Stack Overflow Developer Survey. I would personally make the statement that moving from C to Go is not that challenging. Oh, and while we're on the topic of the most loved languages in the 2020 Stack Overflow Developer Survey, Look at what language tops the list. It's Rust. And yet, Rust is also a systems programming language. And in some ways, it's aiming to topple C++ as the language of choice for large-scale systems. Moving from C++ to Rust is also not that bad from what I heard. So doing projects in C and C++ teaches you great transferable skills. I think that again, I made my point well. So let's move on to the last language in this part of the video. This concern is actually the easiest to refute, in my opinion. If we look at the hyperscalers and other enterprise software companies, the cumulative headcount of technical staff working on either platforms, infrastructure, or distributed systems is very large. Many of those people need to understand computer systems deeply, all the way from networks to operating systems, and sometimes down to how the CPU will execute the exact instruction provided. And the thing is, with the rate at which these hyperscalers expand, there is a very large demand for capable software engineers that understand computer systems at that level. But let's say you don't necessarily want a job as a software engineer. Are there jobs where your CS background in systems will be useful? Actually, yeah. With the rise of automation and hosting, Things in the cloud, DevOps or developer operations, and SRE or site reliability engineering jobs are also on the rise. And those jobs generally pay just as well as software engineering jobs do. You don't even need to sell your soul to some megacorp to enjoy a good quality of life as someone in DevOps. All right, that should be enough to convince you to take some systems courses. So let's discuss how to make the most out of the systems courses that you are now planning to take. Honestly, I did not intend to make a video on good study habits, but here goes. First things first, always research just how time consuming and project heavy the systems courses are at your university. It is very often the case that some courses are particularly heavy, like compilers, and in those cases, you will generally want to lighten your workload in terms of other classes. It's simply not worth it to take a class where when you will not have the time to learn anything or do the work for the class. Second point, start the large assignments early. The sooner you start, the sooner you will hit the certain pain points that the prof or the TAs could help you with. If the assignment is particularly difficult, 
Most students will just crowd the office hours asking for help in the last few days leading up to the deadline. So get ahead of the crowd by actually starting early. Also, the more time you give yourself to work on a project, the more you will understand and learn from the project. Next point, do not forget that the workload in a systems class is not just heavy because of the assignments, but also because the content in the classes can be unintuitive at first. So if you feel like you just can't seem to get the material, then go to the prof with your questions and clarify those unintuitive things until they start to click together. The sooner you get your questions answered, the better you will do on your midterms and assignments. Fourth point is a bit less usual, but try to write down what you think the expected learning outcomes are for a given assignment that you are given to do. The thing is, no matter how seemingly evil and brutal the assignment is, in the eyes of the professor, it serves a very good and specific purpose. Being able to get that sense of purpose for a particularly evil assignment will get you through the deep trenches of that one assembly course you will have to do. Additionally, it actually leads into the next point quite well. The last point is that you should really put down the really big assignments from your systems courses on your resume. I know that most of your peers have done the exact same assignment, but it doesn't matter. Nobody seems to do it. Well, the assignments are often truly impressive and you learn some awesome skills in the meantime. The list of expected learning outcomes you wrote down will help with phrasing the bullet points describing the project better than 95% of the students that took the class with you would be able to come up with on their own months after handing in the assignment. I hope that this advice will make sure that you get the most value out of your systems courses. So looking back on the video, I really do hope that I made a very good case for why systems courses do not actually suck and why if you are a CS student, you should not shy away from them. If I manage to change someone's mind on the topic of systems courses or alleviate the fears of somebody looking at their first mandatory systems course, then I feel that I have succeeded with this video. If you feel like this video is insightful and helpful, then please consider subscribing as it helps more people discover this useful video. Anyways, that is all I wanted to talk about today. Bye.